Terrific. I think we'll kick off now. Um, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming along today uh, to this webinar. My name's Sam Hibbins. I am the uh, Vic Greens MP for Paran and I'm also the uh, acting housing spokesperson whilst Samantha Ratnam is on uh, maternity leave. Uh, so I'll be uh, facilitating today. Um, I'd like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we are all meeting on um, and acknowledge that we're on stolen land and that sovereignty has never been ceded. Uh, and I'd encourage uh, people to acknowledge the traditional owners of the particular lands that you are on. Uh, in the chat box uh, uh, here in Paran, I'm on the lands of the Yalakut Willem clan of the Bunurong language group. Uh, so people feel free to acknowledge your traditional owners in the chat box. Um, a bit of housekeeping before we kick off. Uh, we are recording this webinar. Um, so if you, uh, I guess, are not keen to have your, your um, uh, face being recorded, feel free to turn the, the, the video off. But we do want this to be an interactive webinar. So we want to hear from you. Um, so please use the public chat uh, function, uh, which you can access through the menu at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, type in your comments or your thoughts and your questions. Um, we've got moderators taking the questions in the chat box to ask for our speakers during the Q&A session. So there will be lots of time for question and answers at the end, um, but feel free to pop in your questions uh, throughout the entire webinar. Um, we're going to be begin today with um, a poll, actually. So if we could launch uh, the poll to get things uh, started. Um, <clears throat> as we know, um, public housing in Victoria has been underfunded for uh, uh, a long time, uh, but how do you think we compare to other states and territories in Australia? Are we better or worse or on average? So the poll should be launched now. So put your responses there and we'll share for, we'll share what the responses are, share what the answers are. Is that uh, are people, people accessing that? <coughs> It's an interesting um, question to see where Victoria stands uh, overall. Uh, and we've got, here we go. I think people have got the answer uh, correct. Uh, it is less than other states and territories. Uh, so the answer is option one. Um, and despite being the second most populous state in the country, we actually spend less than half the national average on social housing. So for example, we spend $530 million annually compared to New South Wales, 1.3 billion, uh, Queensland, 628 million, and Western Australia, 829 million. So that's pretty appalling. <clears throat> and it's a pretty uh, uh, apt segue into the introduction of the topic today. Um, the, the hard lockdown of public housing, uh, which occurred recently, um, has put a, a much needed spotlight onto the state of public housing in Victoria. Uh, we know it's been uh, long neglected. We're spending less than any other state on public housing. And really, in my view, um, our approach or the Victorian government's approach to public housing really is um, a case example or a prime example of really the sort of neoliberal uh, economics that have been applied to, to public assets. We've got these a wonderful public assets in our public housing that have been well, so necessary, but run down, neglected, underfunded. Uh, and as you can see from some of the, 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 the situation on some of the estates, um, but, and then in response, the government says, oh, well, looks like we're gonna have to sell it off. Looks like we're gonna have to privatize some estates because that's, that's the only response. Well, that's uh, not the response we need for public housing. We actually need more investment. We actually need um, to put support for public housing at the center <coughs> of um, government social policy. Uh, uh, that's, you, you know, it's just a ridiculous situation we've got here, underfunded public housing and the impact that has on so many people. So today we're going to have a, a discussion about what went on in the lockdown, uh, how it was uh, poorly managed and what, the, what that experience tells us about public housing in Victoria and what we need to do to fix it. Uh, today we've got Ab Ab Abdi Arushi, uh, who's a board member member at AMSA and the operations manager during the public housing lockdown, who are providing so much support for residents during that time. Abdi was on the ground during the lockdown and will speak to us about uh, their experience. 
uh, followed by Ellen Sandell, uh, who's our acting leader at the moment uh, and the member for Melbourne. Uh, and when the towers were under lockdown, <coughs> right, uh, right in or right next to Ellen's electorate, she and her staff spent a lot of time assisting her constituents during that lockdown. So Abdi, uh, we'd like to hear from you first about your experiences um, and what occurred during the lockdown. Uh, hey Sam, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so it was a it was a intense, um, quite chaotic two weeks uh, for me and for me and the team. Um, so you can imagine it was just out of nowhere where uh, this decision was made. Um, the residents were given little or no time to prepare. So they were told, um, I think it was on a Saturday or a Sunday, that uh, they were gonna go on hard lockdown effective immediately, uh, 11.59 that night. So what happened was police obviously came and positioned themselves and they were, they were in locations all under the buildings, all under the nine towers, um, much before the actual time they were supposed to be in uh, lockdown, meaning that nobody could leave and nobody could come back in. Um, and so what did what, what that done was, uh, it made, so it obviously caused a lot of controversy, it caused a lot of anger. Um, uh, it, was, it, was, it was, if anything, it was, it was more of a shock to us and the community. Um, so we sat down with uh, the, um, um, the elderly of, the, the elders of our community who are, uh, um, in charge of uh, running the AMSA, AMSA, AMSA Center. So the difference between the AMSA Center and IYC, um, AMSA Youth Connect, well, AMSA Youth Connect is a youth group organization based in AMSA. So AMSA is the center, but, and it's just more of like a mosque. But the, the youth group, our youth group organization, um, which, which was obviously established on the basis of uh, doing community work and actually making AMSA more than just a mosque, making it more into a community center um, and providing uh, services for the youth uh, that live there, whether it be employment, whether it be sports or recreation, um, whether it be going to camping and extracurricular things. Uh, so that's how we came about. Um, so we've always been there. Um, once we sat down with our elderly and they said, look, um, this is the situation. We told them, hey, look, we want to um, be able to to, to support these people in these residents, which are which are pretty much our people. Like we've had, I have some family members there. I've got aunties that live there. I myself used to live in Kensington, um, so I know I know how it felt uh, to be in in in, in one of these um, estates. Um, in saying that, so we literally had a meeting. We sat down and we said, "Look, okay, look, look what are we going to do? What's our action plan? How are we going to do this?" So at first, there wasn't much thought. It was more just to put out. Um, donations, uh, just spread the awareness and saying, hey, look, AMSA is going to be taking donations to support uh, these um, residents that were in lockdown. And um, so what the government did then was they, because when they locked them, locked them down, they had to provide for their food, they had to provide essentials and all of that. The problem was they didn't know the community the way we knew, we knew the community. The community, the people that were in this residence were people that would come to AMSA, were people just like myself. Um, so we knew what kind of dietary needs they, need, they, they, they required. We knew what kind of cultural foods they needed. Um, and one of the problems the government did was they thought they knew that, uh, which was when they started providing food and it was inadequate food one. Um, and also it was just not culturally um, appropriate. Some of the food was actually non-halal, uh, meaning they couldn't eat. So that's what made us start taking more donations, whether it be essentials, food. Um, so me being the project manager, um, sorry, the operations manager, my role was to just literally facilitate uh, anything that comes in, that was coming into AMSA, whether it be donations, um, literally turning AMSA into, into a production warehouse that was taking in food and, 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 and taking it out just within the same motion and things going in, um, it was quite chaotic at first, uh, but we managed to get the hang of it uh, uh, later on down the track. Um, so what happened was we we focused on each building at a time. So one so one day we would focus on Flemington, and one day we would focus on North Melbourne. Um, obviously, it being a total of nine buildings, it wasn't easy. Um, we had 
um, we had almost, and especially because we were in stage three lockdown, we had to also adhere to the COVID restrictions, meaning we couldn't have as many volunteers as we needed. So we were really, we were really kind of working the clock and we were there from, I remember I was there from 7 a.m. in the morning up until probably 12 midnight every single day for those two weeks. I had to leave my day job, um, which I was currently doing just to be able to, to manage because it was in AMSA. So the people who were in charge of AMSA was AMSA's Connect. So it was almost put upon us to all kind of stop what we were doing and just focus all our attention into this, which I mean now, seeing that they've all finally kind of um, been lifted off the hard lockdown after, you know, after a very long time, after a long two weeks of constantly fighting. And um, we had a lot of problems with the DHSS and uh, Vic Paul and um, all those uh, government agencies who weren't letting our food go up. They, they knew that we, we had the right food. They knew that the residents trusted our food and they wanted um, AMSA to provide for them, uh, which was what we were trying to do, but we had a lot of roadblocks. We had a lot of meetings. We had a lot of um, heated arguments. We, we just couldn't understand why they weren't letting us, or at least facilitating and making it easy for us to, to send food up. Uh, in saying that, um, it, it, was, it was until Flemington was um, lifted off the lockdown and it was just Alfred, 33rd Alfred Street that was remaining, was when the government turned around and said, you know what, um, we recognise that AMSA did a tremendous job um, and, as, and we have you guys in charge of a food that goes up to Alfred, or no matter what it be. So even if they wanted to send something up, whether it, whether it was food, dairy, or whatever, they had to have our approval. So it was it was it was quite interesting how things turned around. But that was obviously after a long, um, long hard fought battle, which um, we were we were quite resilient at the end. Um, it's it's crazy because when you see that group of people that had to quickly come together and mobilize to to pull off a project the size of this, a lot of us don't have professional backgrounds in, in managing something like this. I mean, you know, I'm just, um, just a graduate uh, student <laughs> with a normal day job and living in Maidstone, like had no, no, um, the only community uh, involvement I've had is the MC Youth Connect that I've been to um, for just a year now. So something like this was new to me. Um, and I just, I, I just uh, felt that this was something that uh, we needed to do. Um, it, and it really showed, it really made me proud to be, you know, um, to be an Australian, to be a Malvonian, to see that the amount of support we were reaching, we were getting from um, our, our local community, from the people to be able to respond to a time like this and provide for uh, those who needed it most. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of what happened in the two weeks. Uh, obviously now things have slowed down. But um, obviously, we do understand that there are families who have tested positive. And it's not just the families in North Melbourne and Flemington. We're now catering for um, the families in Carlton, Collingwood, Fitzroy. We've um, sent out hotline numbers uh, for special orders because we understand that it's not just every household doesn't have two to three people. Some households have 10 individuals in that one house. And um, you can imagine how small um, a house like that me me living there personally one of the reasons why we moved out was because it just couldn't we just couldn't fit in a house like that it was with really small rooms small corridors um, the kitchen and the and, and, and the living room all in one area so um, we, we knew that the government probably didn't know but we knew that there were some families in there that required more food so if they were giving the same amount of food to all the residents then there was surely there were some people who weren't getting adequate amount of food Considering as well, some of them had children, babies that needed a certain formula, needed maybe a certain age, uh, their nappy was a certain age. Um, sorry. Um, and uh, the reason why we put out the special orders hotline was so we could reach out, so we could reach out to these people and um, provide for their special needs. Uh, people that had uh, diabetes, that needed medications, we were catering for all of that. So, um, I was just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to say uh, a massive thank you to everyone who's donated, everyone who's um, participated and volunteered, uh, to all the organisations that have worked with AMSA, um, and pretty much everyone that's just uh, been a part of the, the last two weeks and ensuring that um, we're able to, you know, set free people who were who were wrongfully um, 
and uh, um, yeah so I think I'll just leave it on that note and um, that was pretty much my experience uh, being in those two weeks so yeah thank you no thanks thanks Abdi and uh, just note in the, the chat box that chat box that there's a lot of acknowledgement um, of the work that you did uh, and that AMSA did to um, support families um, you know both um, practical support and emotional support to, to everyone. So, so acknowledgement from everyone uh, to you, Abdi, and to, to Amza. Uh, um, it was, it was, I'll tell you that much. It was a team effort. Could have, could have never been possible without everyone coming on board. So, I'm, I'm very grateful to be part of it. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and now, now to uh, Ellen, member for Melbourne. Thanks, Sam, and thanks so much to Abdi and Amza and the incredible community that came together to support these residents. So I'm just going to speak a bit about it from um, my experience of it and then talk a bit broader about public housing. So on oh. Saturday, 4th of July, many people telling them to that they couldn't leave their home for any reason. So imagine if that was you, imagine if you were just about to go out and do your shopping, for example, for the week, perhaps you had a doctor's appointment on Monday or you just ran out of nappies for your baby uh, and to have that police officer there saying, sorry, you can't leave. And not only can you not leave, but we're not going to give you any information about how you can get these essential uh, goods or services. Not only are we going to prevent you from leaving, which Many residents understood this. Most of the residents I talked to understood that they wanted to keep themselves and their families and their community safe. They understood the health rationale for the lockdown. But what happened is not only were they told they couldn't leave, but they were told their family, their friends, their community couldn't bring them anything that they needed either. So they were actually not only prevented from going out and getting the things they needed, they, everyone around was prevented from bringing them what they needed as well. And not only that, but the government had no plan to get people that, so those supplies either. So essentially people were told, you can't leave your house for any reason. And if there's something you need, sorry, too bad, just live with it. And what unfolded over the next few days was pretty horrifying, I have to say, from seeing it on the ground. And it speaks not only to how public housing residents were treated during the lockdown, but also how they've been treated for for several decades really by governments. So over the next five days, my office worked with AMSA and we worked around the clock. As Abdi said, people um, like myself and, and Abdi were working until midnight every night, negotiating with the DHS, with the Premier's office, with the police, with all these different organisations to try and get essential supplies into people and families. And I just wanted to tell you about a few of the cases that I've personally worked on because I think they illustrate just how bad the situation was. And particularly, it was particularly bad in the first few days. After a few days, it did get a lot more organised, but really that was because in that first day, um, AMSA got together and made it happen and showed the government how it could be done. And then uh, AMSA's, AMSA was the one that got organised rather than the government. <laughs> um, so some of the cases that I worked on included um, a family, a woman who, uh, uh, the husband and wife, they've got a two-year-old and they had a premature baby in the Royal Women's Hospital in the a neonatal in intensive care. And so they were locked in their house by the police and um, they were told that they just couldn't visit their baby who was in intensive care. And she was expressing breast milk to take to the baby. So she would take it to the baby every free feed, like four times a day. And they said, no, you can't do that anymore either. So she had no way of getting her express breast milk to her baby. And um, I talked to her husband who was saying he was just watching the, the hours go by, you know, the, the, the 9 a.m. feed went by and he thought, oh no, what's my baby eating? The, the 11.30 feed went by and he thought, gosh, my baby's gonna be getting really hungry. The 2.30 feed went by, still they were calling this, this hotline that DHS set up after 36 hours. They managed to get a hotline together, but um, they, no one was helping them and so it took them five days no four days rather until they eventually got their test expedited um, and were able to get out she the mum was able to get out in a in a ambulance 
to go and see her baby for one hour in full PPE. And so it took until the day before the lockdown ended before she was able to be reunited with her premature baby. Um, there was an elderly woman on the very first day of the lockdown, a woman contacted me and said, my grandmother is in the, one of the Flemington Towers. Um, she usually has a care worker come and cook for her every single day because she's frail and elderly and unwell and she can't, she's not safe for her to cook for herself. So she has a care worker come in and cook. The family were trying, were very worried about what she would do that night for dinner. They were trying to get some food into her, but they were prevented from doing so. And it wasn't until um, we had to advocate every single day to the Premier's office about this case. And it wasn't until three days later that they contacted her and said, yes, sorry, your, your care workers can't come. Um, we'll give you some tinned food for you to heat up. So there's just a couple of the cases that, that happened. A, a woman with a diabetic child who wasn't able to get clean needles for her diabetic child and ended up having to, re, to wash needles um, after three or four days to give her child insulin. The local primary school that we were working with who immediately, once they heard about the lockdown, they had 33 families in the flats and they called them all up and asked them what they needed and they were saying that their kids were bouncing off the walls and they needed something to entertain them for five days. So they, the school got together a whole bunch of iPads um, and some activity books, colouring books and things like that and um, tried to get them in and were prevented from getting laptops in. And we took that all the way to the Secretary of the Department of Justice and the Premier's office and we got approval all the way up the line. And then as they were taking their laptops in on day five, they, um, they got stopped by the police who said they couldn't bring them in because they were worried that people were smuggling drugs in laptops. So just ridiculous situations that we were having to deal with. People who literally were left without food. This happened on a Saturday afternoon. The government, the Premier stood up there at his lectern in front of the media and said, don't worry, all these people will be taken care of. That was on a Saturday afternoon. It wasn't until Sunday, 11 p.m., so a full kind of 36 hours later that the first food boxes appeared. And those food boxes were a small um, cardboard box that had wheat bix but no milk, jam but no bread, you know, just completely inappropriate, and some hot meals um, filled with uh, chorizo, like a chorizo stew filled with pork in buildings that are majority Muslim families um, who, are, who only eat halal. So it was just, there was, there was very, um, and I understand that it happened very quickly. And as the Greens, we didn't question the health rationale for the lockdown. But what we have questioned is how it was that people were treated with such little respect that they were told everything would get taken care of and they literally couldn't get clean needles for their children. Um, food, care for their elderly, breast milk for their premature babies. And so, yeah, as you can tell, I got pretty worked up about it because it was a pretty, um, it was a really difficult time for a lot of people. And we know that it actually, in some ways, could have been prevented. We know that this is an unprecedented situation, but early on in the pandemic, Adam Bant and myself delivered, uh, we printed out a whole bunch of translated material about COVID, about the restrictions during the first lockdown, tried to deliver them to the towers and were told by DHS that we wouldn't be allowed to deliver those into the towers. Um, we paid for community organisations to translate, such as the Carlton Neighbourhood Learning Centre, to translate materials for the people that they worked with because there was no translated materials provided by government at all. Um, and this is for a community where a lot of people, particularly the older generations, don't speak a good English. Um, we wrote to the minister many times about maintenance issues where lifts were broken down, so people were having to congregate into one lift very often. There was no hand sanitizer, there was no extra cleaning, and there's, as Abdi mentioned, there's lots of overcrowding in these areas because people are waiting years and years and years to get a transfer to a bigger public housing place because the government simply isn't building public housing. So these, um, these issues have been ignored by successive state governments, not just this state government, but successive state governments for a long time. And they see public housing really, as I've come to realise, they see public housing as a problem rather than the government as a landlord that should be responsible as any landlord should do. And so we, we've got here because of this neglect of public housing. We have over 80,000 people on the waiting list 
25,000 children. That's even if you get on the waiting list, you're waiting there for five or 10 years. As Sam mentioned, we spend less than any other state per capita on public housing and overall. And there hasn't been a big build of public housing since the 1960s. Can you imagine a government today building those big towers like we have in Flemington, North Melbourne, Carlton? You just don't see building on whatever you think about um, the sufficiency of those towers, you don't see building of that scale of public housing happening around our state. So what do we need? What's the solution? Um, well, we initially called for an inquiry into the management of the lockdown, not the health rationale, but the management of it and how people were left without food and medicine for so long. And fortunately, the Ombudsman has agreed to that and has said that they will do an inquiry. And they're just doing it into the North Melbourne Tower, the one that had the longer lockdown, but we're asking her to expand that to include all the towers. And uh, the Ombudsman has seen the need for this inquiry and has said that we should be able to protect people's human rights and their health at the same time. It's not an either or. And so we encourage you all, we'll put the link in the chat, we encourage you all to make a submission to the Ombudsman asking for that inquiry to look at all the towers, not just 33 Alfred Street. We also just need to build more public housing. It's actually as simple as that. And do a maintenance blitz on the public housing that we have so that it's sufficient and livable for people. And we know that around the world, COVID has thrived in environments where you have overcrowding, where you have insufficient housing. And uh, that's why we're seeing it in places uh, like public housing all around the world. But we know that that's because we're not uh, sufficiently maintaining these properties, we're not giving people appropriate housing. And we can do this in a way that actually benefits everyone around the state because building, pub building housing, construction, is a boon for jobs. And we're going into the biggest recession that any of us have ever seen. And we can create jobs while building public housing. So we can build our way out of the COVID recession in a way that actually looks after people and looks after the economy. So I'm pleased to note I had a text message from Honey, the dad of the premature baby this morning, saying that the baby's doing really well. They're very pleased. They're, they're getting to visit every day now. And, um, she's doing really well, the mum and, and the little baby, and they're very grateful for the amount of outpouring of support that everyone gave them. It was a phenomenal community effort. And I also just want to say there was a lot of people on the ground who uh, contributed to this effort. So we had the Red Cross volunteers there. We had so many health workers, mental health workers, social workers, uh, so many people, people donating, um, so many people trying to help. The problem wasn't those people. Those, those people were doing a phenomenal job. The problem was that the government sent the police in without the healthcare workers, the social workers, information for people about why they were locked in, how they could access support, or a plan to feed them. We know they didn't have very much notice, but there's really no excuse to, to send the police in without those support workers in the first place. And then no excuse to allow people to wait four or five days before they actually got essential items for life. I just can't imagine if someone locked me in my house and said I couldn't go out to get nappies for my baby and also my family and friends couldn't bring me nappies either. I mean, that would be a disaster in my house. And that's um, what these people experienced was so much more than that. So that's a little bit of a snapshot of how I see the situation and really happy to take people's questions. Terrific, thanks, Ellen. Um, and, you know, I might, be a bit, I might be a bit biased, but it was good of me just observing what was happening on the estates to have an MP or both you and Adam who've got a, a record of supporting of public housing tenants. Um, you know, not just supporting, supporting tenants, but then also, you know, when things weren't going right, calling it out and, you know, if you'd just listened to what the government was saying, you would have thought everything was kind of, it was hunky-dory, everything was going okay, but clearly it wasn't. And so it was terrific to have yourself and Adam, you know, really shining a light at what was actually going on, the truth as to what actually was happening on the estates. Um, so we've got a lot of lot of questions. Thank you everyone for, for putting in those. Um, we'll try and get through as many as, as possible. Um, but I thought I'd first start off with a question uh, from Louise, uh, who asks about what sort of support was being provided to residents in the lead up to the lockdown. Uh, so obviously in response to COVID, um, you know, public housing tenants needed to be, be supported. What was the situation on the estates uh, prior to the, to the lockdown? 
either Abdi or Ellen. You want to go, Abdi? You can go first. <laughs> sorry, sorry, the question was just what was the situation on the estates with COVID or just in general? Yeah, in response to COVID, uh, what sort of, so, and what sort of support was being provided to, to residents and tenants? Mm. So, I mean, obviously residents of public housing are just like uh, anyone else in the community. So they were watching the press conferences and you know, getting their, their media in their normal ways. And so uh, adhering to the restrictions just the same way anyone else was. Um, but the difference is with this population is that it's high density. Um, there's a lot of overcrowding because um, you've got maybe three or four or five or six kids in, and parents in a two bedroom apartment waiting for a transfer for five years and haven't been able to get one. So, um, and then the maintenance issues that contributed, like I said, mentioned the broken down lifts. Um, the, a lot of um, people who lived in other high rise towers, so private high rise towers, the owner of the buildings, you know, put hand sanitizer in the lobby and did more regular cleaning of those high touch surfaces like lift buttons and doorknobs and things like that. But unfortunately that just didn't happen in the public housing. We've had so many people tell us that there was no extra cleaning. Um, we actually went down to check a number of times and hand sanitizers were put there just at the bottom, not on every floor. Um, but after a day or two, they were empty and they were never replaced. And as I mentioned, there was no appropriate information given in language. Um, and there are a lot of people who, particularly the older generations who don't speak great English. And so that's why we actually did some of that ourselves. Some of the local community organisations attempted to do that too, but it really should have been provided by the government. So as far as I could tell from the ones that are in my electorate, very little prevention work was done that was specific to the community, less than what happened in private, similar sized private buildings. I don't know what your experience was, Abdi. Um, it's not too different. Uh, like you said, um, one of the one of the things that I've noticed was the fact that a lot of the people in these residents or high rises, they don't really speak much English. So even 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 if they were listening to the, watching the news or, or some of them didn't even know what was going on. Um, and I remember even after the lockdown, when we were doing special orders and we were do, do, doing door knocking to um, residents in Flemington. Uh, some of the residents were shocked to see us like when we knocked on the door and we said, you know, hey, do you need anything? How's everything going? Um, one, I remember it was, I think it was a um, a lady of a Chinese background said to me, like, well, what's, what's happening? Where, where are the police? How come you guys are here? And I, and I told her, what do, you, what do you mean? Do you not know you're not on lockdown anymore? You can go out and you can get essentials, you can do shopping. And then she was like, no, nobody told me. I was just told to stay in here and the only thing I, I ever saw was just police officers and um, people with uh, PPE. Like she didn't know what they, what, what they were called, um, and that really that really showed me that um, a lot of people didn't even know what was going on. Uh, even uh, and she had little little or no English. So one of the girls that were volunteering with me spoke Mandarin, so she got more of the information. And we actually found out that she was. Um, she was uh, she was a, she was disabled, and she had a daughter who was um, who really needed like um, special needs, and they were just both stuck in there, and nobody's probably has no idea that uh, like people like that lived there. So we, we 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 got ambulance to come in and have a look at the situation and, and see how they were going, and we we obviously we obviously went back and bought them food and anything they needed. So um, it it really shows well, one was the communication. Uh, definitely, at least DHSS should have organised translators uh, on their hotlines to ensure that people were getting what they needed. Um, um, and the main other, sorry, the, the main the main other thing was just the food, the the the, the, the poor choice in food and the the, the neglect um, in people's mental health and uh, and social well-being. And just to add to that. Um in terms of preventing this from happening again, so the Greens MPs and a lot of the local community organisations have been doing a lot of work in other towers now as well. So as soon as this happened, we obviously got a bit scared that this could happen in Carlton or other high-rise flats that are in a similar situation. So um, we actually asked the government to go and do mobile testing at the bottom of all of those towers and actually door knock those towers and ask people to come down for testing on site, which they did to their credit. 
but the first day they did it in Carlton, they did it like late on a Thursday night and didn't tell anyone. And then the next morning, Friday morning, we went down there and we worked with the Carlton neighbourhood house to actually get translators down there because there was just, there was nurses um, and a doctor who were doing an incredible job, but they were about, the housing department were about to go and door knock the floors with no translators or anything. That's a pretty scary thing for people if all of a sudden you just get confronted by someone saying you have to come and get tested or you'll get locked down. So we arranged um, 20 or 30 community volunteers to go and actually do that in different languages, which made a big difference. And now that testing's being rolled out to all the public housing towers. And I know Sam in Paran has actually just gone down himself and made bundles of, of masks and gloves and hand sanitizer um, because that was a quicker way than getting it through the mm. government, which is a bit yes. of a sorry state of affairs. Yeah, there was obviously a lot of concern in, the, in other public housing estates across Melbourne in terms of they, them fearing that they needed to go in lockdown. So just, I know some community groups helping Hoops and Our Patch uh, and in Richmond, well, you know, the, the best thing to allay fears was to just get PPE into people's hands. Um, and that hopefully um, allayed some fears in some of those estates. We've got two questions that lead on from, from the last one. Uh, one from Loretta in that, there are still issues regarding communication with the community and support for those that are in quarantine. How can we improve the process for communication and supports? And from Olivia, is there now sufficient health information in community languages? I'm happy to start if you're all right, Abdi, and then go to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in terms of, um, so the first part of the question is what's happening now in those communities with quarantine, is that right? Uh, in terms of community, there are still issues regarding communi communication. Yeah, gotcha. yep. yeah, so if you see any specific examples of breakdowns in communication or these systemic issues, please send them to my office. So that's office at ellensandal.com. Emailing me is the best place to do that because we're still in daily touch with the Premier's office um, and, and the Health Minister's office, the Housing Minister's office and daily we're feeding them issues. So it's almost like we're kind of identifying the spot fires and asking them to put them out. And that has been quite effective. Um, Cause they're not on the ground. They're, they're not really connected to the community. They're not really sure what's going on. But when we start to make noise about something, it gets fixed. So if there are particular issues, let us know. Can't promise that they'll fix all of them, but we'll try. And in terms of what's happening in community language now, my understanding is that it's gotten a little bit better. But um, so, for example, now there's um, signs in a lot of those towers on each floor talking about COVID and what you can do to protect yourself. But I'm not sure, Abdi, you, you might have been down there a bit more than me and yeah. know what's happening with languages. Yeah, there is. Um, I've seen a couple of signs uh, in different languages, whether they be Arabic, um, Amharic. But it's, I don't think it's enough. I don't think it's, it's expressed enough. Um, a lot of people, like I said, uh, are elderly people. Um, and they, they don't speak the best of English. So um, even we found it hard to communicate with them sometimes if we weren't, if we weren't from the same background. Uh, so a lot of, um, so what we done was we put out a special orders uh, hotline and that hotline was, was literally anything. It could even be if you had a vacuum cleaner and your, 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 your bag ran out, we went, and went to Harvey Norman and we would go get you that bag. So there was no limit to what they uh, were asking us and we were, we were happy to provide anything they needed. Um, and what we did was because we knew that people that might call that obviously couldn't leave their house because they've tested positive, they might um, be from different, they might only speak a certain language. So what we did was I assembled a team of um, special orders, uh, uh, volunteers who spoke in different languages. So I had, a, I had, we have now a total of, I think, seven, seven different languages that we provide. Um, so if the person calls and says, okay, I want to speak to someone that speaks Amharic or Oromo or um, Tigrinya or Somali or, or, you know, or whatever it may be, even Mandarin and, um, and, and, and those other uh, languages, we were providing that. So in terms of communication, uh, I think we're doing quite well in the fact that we're very diverse in, in, um, in, in, in providing that hotline is actually making it easier for us to get them what they need. And like, there's a better, there's a better understanding in, in what they want. Yeah. Mm. Terrific. Um, we've got now a question from Robin for you, Abdi. Uh, great work, Abdi. Uh, but I'm interested in what you can tell us about the reasons for the difficulty with the police, in particular, about the deliveries into the building. 
Yeah, so um, a lot of the time, the police were a bit... Uh, they were just so hard to deal with, even though we, we, we spoke to them, we said, look, we're volunteers from AMSA. Um, we've, we've, we've had meetings with the DHSS. We've, we've been given um, their approval. A lot of the reasons why they made it hard for us was because they were saying, we don't have people that are going to take your stuff up. And we were, we were obviously not allowed to go into the building. So what that did was it, it was almost like um, we're not going to touch your food. We're not, we're not paid to take your stuff upstairs. We're just, we're, just, we're just paid to stay here and um, make sure nobody comes in and out. So we were here with our food, uh, truck loads of food, actually, because we were provided for every single house. Um, so we would come with our trucks in our vans. And then when we wanted to like offload our, our, our goods, um, we were told, uh, yeah, bring it here. And they'll, they'll, they'll just leave it in the lobby. And then we'll get calls from residents saying, um, you guys said you guys sent food. We haven't received it yet. You know? And then that, that would make us go back to the DHSS or go to them. So there's a lot of heated exchange. Um, I, I, I just feel like, I don't know why, but they just felt quite, not, I wouldn't say intimidated, but they were just, uh, some, some police were very understanding. They were like, oh, we love the fact that you, we love the work that you guys are doing and uh, we, we want to help as much as we can, but it, the right person I have to be here to take your food up. And some of them would just be like, what are you guys doing here? That food could be contaminated. Um, we're not taking this up. And a lot of the miscommunication that happened with the police was because we would, we would have a meeting with the DHSS, right? Um, sorry, I'm just getting too many phone calls. Uh, and and um, the DHSS would say, yep, we've approved. You can take your food up to, let's just say, building 130. So we would go there and then the chief of uh, police, the guy who was in charge at uh, each building, he wasn't informed or there was a lack of communication. So the ones on ground were saying, no one's allowed here. We haven't received no information that we're allowed to send whatever you guys are trying to take up here. Um, so there was that constant going back and forth. Uh, and that was literally because everything was a shambles in the, in the aspect of the government and um, the, the chain of communication was not, was not the best. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and there was also... Mm, it was, and from my perspective, it was... Go... So, um, yeah, as in like, and also I uh, just want to add on the, the fact that um, police were just quite heated anytime we were there, even though we, we had City of Melbourne staff tags or, you know, um, that we had the staff tags and we were there. Uh, funny thing is we were actually the ones to go into the lobbies of the buildings and uh, bring the food out. But the, the moment they'll see us just walking around, the same people, the same volunteers, we were subject to um, police abuse or some of the girls were, like we were, were, were reported to be pushed, um, told to go away. Uh, and it was, a lot of that was just unnecessary, even though we said, we're, we're the people across the road who have been providing for these people. You have no right to tell us to leave this area when you know, we, we were literally downstairs, every single building, giving food. So um, it was, with the, with the police, I think that was the biggest issue. Um, they, they just made the experience a lot, much, a lot more harder than, than, it, than it should have been. And I think it's important to remember that this is a community with a history of over-policing. So just last year, or I think it was, um, you know, the, the, it was that right-wing guy from America or England who came and deliberately did this really kind of racist neo-Nazi speech across the road from the Flemington housing estate, um, which drew a lot of protest. And after that, the riot police were sent in and to kind of chase protesters, um, mostly kind of you know, teenage or young African men through the estates. And there was kind of just this huge, um, you know, right, right police presence on the, on the estate. There's also been um, situations of, lots and lots of situations of racial profiling in that area. And a lot of people have won payouts from the police because of that racist over-policing. So it, it, this comes on top of this history. And then the government sent the police in and didn't send anyone to support them so people were telling me that literally they would open their front door not knowing they could go out and the police would be there and say sorry you can't leave your home because you're in lockdown and they'd say sure fine I get that I don't want to leave I just need this thing like insulin needles um what can I do who do I talk to and the police weren't given any information so all they were told to do was to make sure people didn't leave so people would open the door and say that's fine but I need nappies or I need insulin needles mm -hmm. and the police would say get back inside get back inside and just yell yell and yell and yell till they shut the door um, we had one situation of a woman, a young woman who was in acute mental distress, who had a long history of 
of mental illness, her caseworker called us and said, I need, we need to um, have a mental health check on her. Um, the police wouldn't let a mental health worker in and refused to do the check themselves because that's not what they were there for. She ended up getting so distressed, she essentially ran out of her house and downstairs and got arrested. So it's just, it was this escalating rather than, it's like a force-led response rather than a care-led response. And as I just said, just the, the confusion and the mismanagement, and that wasn't just in the first few hours, that was, that lasted days on Tuesday, I think it was, this happened on Saturday, so three days later, the government eventually called in the State Control Centre, so Emergency Services, the SES, and the City of Melbourne, because they were two organisations that actually were experienced at managing crises and getting essentials into people during bushfires, for example. They called them in because DHS had done such a bad job. Um, and I think things got a little bit better after that, but again, just so much confusion. And, and the situation with the laptops was one of my stories that still makes me just laugh in exasperation where this school, the principal literally had these laptops in his car trying to get them in and got approval all the way up to the secretary of the department and then was stopped by the police because they said, oh no, we can't risk people taking drugs in. Like, it's just, their pri the police's priorities are just completely wrong. That then leads on to a, just another question about school students and how, uh, from Pauline, who's interested to know how school students and their parents were supported. Um, you know, is there free Wi-Fi and how the digital divide has impacted on families and whether there's ongoing needs of students in terms of educational support? There's not, not free Wi-Fi, no. Um, the, the department told me a couple of days ago they're working on looking at free Wi-Fi, <laughs> but you know how long's it been? Um, and mostly they were supported just, like I said, through their teachers and, and principals who identified that they were locked in, identified they might have some needs. And Ellen's oh, that's really the only way I think that students were supported. You lost me there for a minute. Yeah. Just a second. I think you got you got the gist of what I said. I think um, another kind of frustrating thing, and look, I've been big supporters of, of Daniel Andrews throughout this and his health led response, but just the fact that he was saying things were happening when they weren't. One of the things that happened early on is um, on Facebook and Twitter, he posted this box of here's what we're giving all kids, aren't we kind? It was a box of kind of colouring books and crayons and stuff, um, seeds to plant in a place where, you know, they can't even open the window. I don't know where they were going to plant the seeds, but um, air freshener, they gave them each a little air freshener thing. Mm. But they, they put this on, fa on Facebook to say, look how great we are, we're delivering these to the kids. But actually, virtually none of those boxes made its way in. They just dumped them in the lobby, but no one was allowed down to the lobby and they never took them up to families. And so families were calling us and saying, my kids are jumping off the walls. Um, where are these coloring, coloring books? And mm. most families never got them. Mm. Well, I think that leads on to the, uh, the next, next two, two questions, but I, I think that the issue around the laptops is um, very telling the fact that there's all these school students in public housing towers and across the state who don't have access to the internet or a laptop or a device. Um, that should be standard for any school, any school student at any time, let alone now, to be able to actually have a proper and access proper education. So that's something we're taking up as well directly with the government to make sure that if any kid's been supplied with a laptop or Wi-Fi that they uh, get to keep it permanently. And then the government needs to actually look and make sure because there's apparently there's, they supplied over 50,000 of these devices to the state, 50,000 kids without access to a laptop um, is an appalling situation to begin with. And so we're pushing to make sure that that's addressed um, as well. Um, but there's two questions in terms of the government's, two interesting questions in regards to the government's uh, approach. Uh, one from Laura, uh, do you think that the media slash Daniel Andrews deliberately misled the public in explaining how public housing residents were being looked after? Why would they want to divert attention from a situation that clearly needs aid? If I personally hadn't looked into it further, I wouldn't have known what went on purely based on the government's press conferences alone, situation could have been eased if awareness was raised. And then secondly, a question from Barbara, do you think all these people helping and donating are actually letting the government off the hook and doing the work that government should be doing, which is an interesting perspective. Mm. So, uh, I don't know why 
he got up in the press conference and said all this was being taken care of. I think partly, probably he thought it was being taken care of, but I think mostly it's about they. They want to sell a good story, right, to the public. They don't want any... But you got me still? Yep. Um, no, they want to look like the good guys and they don't want any criticism. And if people raise criticism, they want to stamp it out as quickly as possible, which is why they did the, you know, here's the Facebook thing of the colouring books that are being sent to kids. Um, and I think that it's, a, it's compounded by this cultural problem that both sides of politics have, Labor and the Liberals, where they see public housing as a problem and they see the people who live there as a problem and they want them to get out as quick as possible and they're not interested in being a, a landlord. Um, they're doing the bare minimum that they can possibly get away with. Um, and I think you see that even in the language they were using, they were saying, you know, these are towers full of vulnerable people. It's like, well, actually, they're just Yes, there are some vulnerable people in there, but there's also some incredibly resilient, impressive leaders um, who are all throughout those towers and families that are just trying to get by just like anyone else in Victoria. But they treated them almost like they couldn't be trusted to stay in their home. And that, like, they had to bring the police in first because these were people who couldn't be trusted and the food and the essentials were secondary. Yeah. Um... I think to add to that, yeah, uh, I'm not quite sure why he made it seem like it was under control because us being there in the front lines and seeing, experiencing everything that was going on, we knew that uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't the way it should be. Um, we, and and, and, and then I don't think the media showed not even 10% of the actual stuff that were going on. Uh, I, I guess that's why we, as MC Youth Connect, had a lot of media attention because we were literally the eyes uh, showing everything that was going on. Like, I think a lot of people became aware of what was happening just by following our Instagram page and we were constantly posting up stories about us going up to the flat and the problems we were having with the police and how food was getting sent back and, 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 and from, from literally from packaging the food to all the volunteers and, and, and everyone involved. So I think our, our, our platform kind of shed light on the truth that was actually happening in these two weeks as opposed to what you saw on the, on, on, on the news um, which which I guess yeah it's it's something that I thought he, he probably thought was handled but I uh, really wasn't the, and, and the main reason is because uh, the, the, the government it just kind of shows it goes to show that the government doesn't really know the needs of the community as well as the people themselves the people of the community know themselves. And, that, and, and I feel like if anything was learnt from, from this, um, this experience, it was definitely that. Mm, absolutely. Now, I'm going to ask the last uh, few questions are about public housing more broadly. I recognise we're coming very close to two o'clock. Um, so I'll ask you just a, a, a few questions that people have asked. Um, firstly, uh, from Elizabeth, how can governments fund the expansion of social slash affordable housing? Uh, is this is this something that the government is intending to do? Um, and uh, why is the from Charlotte? Why is the Victorian government so attracted to building roads but not housing? Uh, Eve has asked whether in, uh, intentionally vacant private rental properties can be utilised for public housing or for those on the public housing waiting lists. And Susan has also asked about uh, Bang Street, and I think that probably a good question about more broadly. Uh, the public housing, what's happening with the public housing renewal program. So a few threads there, but if I could ask uh, Ellen and Abdi to talk more broadly about public housing in Victoria and the issues there. Do you want to go first, Abdi? You can, no, you can go. I think this is your... <laughs> um, so lots, there's lots there. So as I said, over several decades, we've underinvested in public housing. And part of the reason it's in a state of disrepair is no money for maintenance, but also not building new public housing, which is why the waiting list is so long. Um, and so we've been raising this over many years and um, we did quite successfully a couple of years ago in a public housing inquiry. So we got a parliamentary inquiry into the state of public housing and we got a lot of information about the state of public housing that we'd never had before, that community organisations had never had before, which was quite useful. And it put such pressure on the government 
that they had to do something. Um, and one of, one of the things they did do was commit to a thousand new public housing units across Melbourne, like Paran, Geelong, a few other places. Um, but a thousand when there's 80,000 people on the waiting list is not going to cut it. Um, they've also decided to sell off a bunch of public housing sites in the inner city, the more low rise ones, what we call the walk ups, um, in places like North Melbourne, Brunswick, uh, North Gert, other places. They're selling them to private developers. They say that they will build back better public housing plus private development, but actually overall there's going to be fewer public housing beds and bedrooms once they've, they've privatised it and you know, developers will make a mint. So that really shows the government's attitude to this is, is privatise it, is the way they think they'll solve it. There are lots of creative solutions out there like using empty buildings for temporary housing, um, you know, requiring big new developers to put a portion of their development to social housing. But at the end of the day, all of these things are good and we want to support social and community housing as well. But at the end of the day, the only thing that's going to put a dent in that 80,000 waiting list is a really big concerted build of public housing over many years and a big investment. And the government has always resisted that. But I think now with COVID and going into recession, they're looking for shovel ready projects to create jobs and deal with social problems um, of which homelessness is one. And so I think now is the right time to push for that policy, which is our policy, which is for a big build to actually make sure that people have appropriate housing. Um, I, th I just think uh, Ellen just said that very well. Um, so yeah, <laughs> not much more I can add to that, but um, I think, yeah, it, it's something that we, we, the government definitely needs to find a, a solution for, because um, I know a lot of these families have actually applied for housing um, in different areas. Um, and it just, the waiting, like, like, like Ellen said, the waiting time is, is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, and I remember personally how long it took us to move out of Kensington to the home we live in to the, um, to, um, now. It, it's really hard for, for especially first generation uh, Australians um, to kind of settle in and be part of the economy and I guess contribute more if, if they're kind of being stuck into areas like this where there's um, poor, um, like you said, there's poor uh, infrastructure, there's, there's low hygiene, there's, they're, they're not really looked after, they're not, um, they're not like, they're not being repaired or, um, you know, uh, renewed like, like the walk ups and the more new areas. But um, in that sense, I think, yeah, it's something that the government should definitely work on. And I don't know why they build more roads than um, buildings um, mm -hmm. clearly with the with the with the with the population increasing as every year goes by um, we definitely need to look for a solution yeah absolutely i mean we see the the government you know building also you know obviously uh, uh roads and and transport infrastructure and all sorts all sorts of uh parts of their their infrastructure agenda but what's missing from it is housing and, and public housing so that's certainly something we need to continue up the the, the push for um uh, can I just put in a plug for what people can do? Or are you going to do that, Sam? Um, so a few oh, things gonna... that... <laughs> I'll say it and then you can say it again. Um, so a few, things, it's a few things that people can do. One, donate to AMSA. They're still doing incredible work. AMSSA, um, they can use the money. Um, and it's all used in phenomenal ways. Um, secondly, write to the Ombudsman, ask for the inquiry to be expanded to the whole nine towers and that you were shocked about what you saw. Uh, and thirdly, join our campaign for a big build of public housing. We'll put the links in the chat. Fantastic. Terrific. Well, look, thank you. Uh, thanks, Alan, and thank you, Abdi. Uh, yeah. And again, acknowledge all the fantastic work that um, yourself and AMSA and everyone who's providing support to uh, public housing tenants are doing. And thank you, everyone, for uh, joining in today. Um, and let's take this, this, this now, I think, renewed interest from uh, the wider public into our public from our into our public housing estates. Uh, let's turn that into action and getting some much needed investment into public housing. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you. Bye bye.